Thank you all for coming, and I'd like to uh, introduce our, our um, facilitator for today, uh, who is chatting away over there, Regina Phillips. Regina is um, an alum of the School of Social Work, and today's event is the second of two parts of programming we have that's called Empowering Cultural Education. It's a grant-funded program um, that um, the School of Social Work has developed to um, create culturally uh, responsive uh, curriculum um, in, in conjunction with members of our community. And so today's presentation is really going to look at um, health providers and working with um, the refugee and immigrant community. So Regina, here you go. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. We have um, five amazing people who are going to be spending the next hour and a half with us talking about, from, from different sectors, talking about health care um, and dental care for the refugee and immigrant community and also people of color. So right now I'm going to ask our panelists to, if you would like to hop on stage. And I will too. And I want to let you know that we have, um, we're going to have question and answering period. And so um, if you have any questions whatsoever, um, please let us know and I will make sure that I can get the mic to you. And so I'm just going to quickly uh, let you know who's here. And then after that, everybody will introduce themselves. And then um, we'll get started on <clears throat> them telling you what they actually do. Um, so we have Susan Doughty here. And Susan uh, uh, is the, uh, wor works at Simmons College in Massachusetts, but she lives in Maine. Um, and she used to work as a women's health practitioner. Um, and she's going to be here telling us about her experience working with the refugee and immigrant community. Um, next to her, we have Dr. Lucy Amory, um, who works at Maine Medical Sp Center, but spends time in Westbrook. I don't know if, is there a lot of people here from Westbrook, or do you know where Westbrook is? Some? Some? Yeah. <laughs> There's two in the front. Um, and uh, so there is a medical center in Westbrook. I actually work in Westbrook. Um, and that's where um, Dr. Amri spends some of her time, but she also works at Maine Medical. Um, next to her is Erico Fondsworth. And um, Erico uh, works at Greater Portland Health on Park Avenue. Um, and she is the program uh, manager for the Pathways program. And it's a substance abuse uh, program uh, that they have at Greater Portland Health. Next to her is Dr. Owoso. Did I say that right? <laughs> I have a feeling I didn't. Um, and uh, he uh, works right here at the University of New England um, in the dental school. And so we are waiting for one more panelist. Uh, her name is Kate Gaynor, and she also works at Greater Portland Health. And so as soon as she gets here, We'll welcome her on stage. But at this point in time, I'm going to turn the mic over um, to Dr. Owoso, and he can tell you about what he does. And then um, after introductions, and after they tell you what you do, we'll open it up for questions. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's nice to be here with, you, with every one of you here. Uh, as I said, my name is uh, Adipitan Owosho. I'm a faculty at the dental school, the College of Dental Medicine here at UNE. I'm actually a pathologist which is uh, an oral and musculoskeletal pathologist. So basically, uh, I'm the guy that deals with the oral cancer and things like that, from tobacco, from, from the HPV, vi H HPV virus, papilloma virus, and things like that, and all other forms of lesions in the mouth, not just oral cancer. There could be so many things going on within the oral cavity. And the oral cavity, as, as I say, is the gateway to the body. So. This, you know, so it's a very important component of the body. So I basically did come from, uh, originally I'm from Nigeria. I actually did my dental school training in Nigeria and I relocated to the United States in 2000 and, I'm trying to remember, 2011. And when I came in, I, started a res I went to a residency program at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. That was where I did my residency in pathology. And after doing the, completing the residency there, I went on to do a fellowship 
at Memorial Sloan, the Casa Center in New York, Manhattan. I spent two years there, and after that, I did join UNE as the as a faculty year at the dental school. So that's briefly about who I am and what I do. <laughs> Hi, my name is Erica Farnsworth. Um, it's nice to meet you all, and um, glad to be here. I am originally from Japan. I moved here when I went to college. Um, don't care to mention how many years ago, um, but um, I work with Greater Portland Health. I'm the program manager for the substance use disorder treatment, which includes the opiate use disorder treatment um, using medication-assisted treatment. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the um, opioid epidemic that has been raging this, um, ravaging this nation right now. Um, so we have a lot of patients accessing our um, medication-assisted treatment or the MAP program. I, once when I moved here, um, it took me years to figure out that SNL is a funny program and I could laugh at it, but totally, it took me years to understand the health care programs that are offered here in the United States. It is so different from the, the national um, health care that is offered in Japan. Um, it's a, a right given to each citizen, so you have the um, basic care that is taken care of. Also, I got to spend three years in England, which is also a government national health care service which is also very different. Um, most of the patients that we see at Greater Portland Health, we have, um, we have nine different locations, and um, through them is our primary care, and I think Kate Gaynor, who's my colleague, um, can explain, but um, some of them are school-based. Our primary care um, that we offer at 180 Park um, is primarily refugee and immigrant services. And we have experienced that in that population, we have more of the alcohol dependence or alcohol abuse that's prevalent in that population. And it is very hard to um, get into treatment with them or even to discuss that piece of um, disease or the disorder. Um, we have most of our um, patients that are accessing the MAT, the medication-assisted treatment for opioid use, are um, Caucasians um, that primarily from Maine. Very small group, there's probably about 3% of the patients that we um, provide services for have um, OUD or opioid use disorder diagnosis. But most are alcohol use, uh, dependence or abuse. We have some cocaine, I think 15 years ago, we used to see maybe once a year heroin use, or two or three times um, patients would come in and say, I have opioid um, dependence. Um, as, but as the years went on, we were finding that um, more and more the patients were getting younger, people coming in in their late teens and 20s, saying that they've been addicted for five years. Um, on morphine, on oxys, we're finding more and more, and now the shift is moving toward heroin use. Um, not injection, but snorting. Uh, so those are our big concerns. Uh, my name is Lucy Amory. Hey. I'm from Maine. <laughs> not as exciting, but uh, I love it. And I'm loyal. Um, I spent some time um, in the Mississippi Delta working um, with Teach for America before going to med school and then have worked abroad in healthcare in Haiti and in Malawi, um, as well as a few other places, Poland, Africa, working in some lower resource health um, settings. And then trained in Portland, Oregon at OHSU before coming back home to Maine. And um, I work primarily out of the uh, Westbrook office, which is with Maine Medical Partners, which is under the sort of umbrella of health that Maine Health and Maine Med works with. And um, I thought coming home to Maine, I would be doing lots of um, ear infections and things like that, and have been really happily surprised with the growing diversity, especially that Westbrook is lucky enough to have, and 
a lot of our patients that, um, that I am seeing come through Greater Portland Health um, or through the pediatric clinic at Maine Med. And then as they sort of find housing and are moved a little bit out of the city of Portland, a lot of them are moving into Westbrook because housing is available. And um, so we have been, our knowledge about refugee health um, has been growing with the population, which has been really exciting to see. And, um, and it's um, a growing, growing um, experience for everybody. And I'm really lucky at Westbrook we have um, a sort of a team approach with social workers, behavioral health specialists, pharmacists, um, as well as the physicians and nurse practitioners that are there. Um, but we also draw a lot on the um, expertise from Greater Portland Health who sort of do the, a lot of the brunt work of triaging those patients and, and getting them set up with what they need, as well as um, the main hospital. Um, and because today is talking about not just refugees health, but disparities and access to care. I think the other thing I get to see in Westbrook a lot is um, sort of the poverty that is prevalent in Maine and that sometimes if you're living right along the coast, you see beautiful vacation homes and it's really lovely, but you don't have to go very far. In fact, Westbrook, even though two, only two of you raise your hands, it's actually just nine minutes down the road. And um, of the patients that we see, a huge portion are on Maine care or Medicaid. Um, and if you screen for trauma or how many of you have been uh, with food insecurities in the last month, vast majority raise their hand. And I think that it's our job as social workers, physical therapists, physicians, counselors to ask those questions because they're hard to ask, but a lot of people are actually willing to say yes and receive help. So um, I thank you all for coming today and uh, be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Lucy. I'm Susan Dowdy. I'm a women's health nurse practitioner. And I was asked to um, help the immigrant women, the refugee women, mostly sub-Saharan women, in the In Her Presence English program, which is a volunteer program, to learn the names of the, their reproductive parts because they were not allowed to talk about this in their home countries and they didn't know how to articulate what was going on with their providers if they had a problem. So not only were they learning English, but they were learning words that, they needed to learn words to uh, put um, into sentences what they could uh, say to their providers when they had a problem. So I was asked to uh, spearhead that program just one year ago, and I had two other nurse practitioners with me to do that. We had to learn a lot about our population because in Maine we see mostly Caucasian, not, not so much as, as, uh, as my, my previous um, history and practice, um, which is wonderful to see. So we listened to Safe Space Radio, the interviews with the Burundi women who are refugees, and m most of them, the three interviews that I listened to, Ann Hallward is the psychiatrist who runs this, and if you haven't heard it, it's really well worth your while. Um, all of the, the three Burundi women who were interviewed said that 100% of the Burundi women who come have been raped. So we needed to, to learn about uh, teaching victims of trauma about their sexual organs. And, and there's a curriculum for that, which we studied. We also needed to set ground rules in our classes so that they knew that they were safe and that we could develop trust. Um, we had uh, interpreters, the beginning handouts that we supplied them were in both French and English because it's primarily French population, French speaking population that we were addressing. And then we would split the group up into English proficiency so that the new learners and the medium learners and the, ex the experienced learners in English were separate. And then we each, each of the three nurse practitioners had a, an interpreter with us so that we had an overview and we, they had vocabulary words to learn in advance. And then we would meet with them one Saturday a month for about four or five months. And um, we, would just, we would have an overview with the vocabulary words following the ground rules that this is safe space, there's no um, wrong question. If they had a question they wanted to write down, they could put it in the question box. Um, and then we would answer their questions with a somewhat of a curriculum that we wanted them to understand. Um, we learned so much from them about um, their experiences and about what they wanted to know rather than us 
telling them what we thought they needed to know. We really met them where they were. And so this year, we've incorporated more nurse practitioners and physicians, um, and we're looking into prevention and wellness and cardiovascular and diabetes as well as reproductive health. And Kate's joined us in that effort too. So we um, divided it up into to the breast and nursing. We Then we uh, talk about the uterus, the vagina, the cervix, and sexually transmitted infections and contraception. One of my peak experiences was last year with the Women's March. I was teaching and I wasn't able to go marching, but my class uh, learned that the male determines the gender of the fetus. And the women were so surprised because they usually got into a lot of trouble if they had a female child, not knowing that their partner had um, determine the gender of the fetus. So um, those, those are peak experiences for us. And um, we talk about um, menopause because there are a fair number of older women. Um, and we talked about when, mostly, when do you seek help and how, what kind of help do you seek? What kind of symptoms do you have that you should get help for? Heavy menstrual bleeding or irregular cycles or stopped periods, that kind of thing. So it's been quite an experience for me. And I'll hand it over to Kate. Hi, I'm Kate Gaynor. I'm one of the clinical directors at, for Greater Portland Health. I've been a NP for 12 years in Maine. I've worked in rural care and learned a lot about the disparities for our rural population. And then I worked with a very wealthy, affluent women's population for about four years. And I've been at uh, Greater Portland Health for the last four years. Um, my main responsibilities are running um, our public housing locations. So I have run, been running and in charge and the solo provider at our Riverton Park location, which is on Outer Forest Ave. It's a Portland Housing Authority development. We have a um, one room, one bathroom, waiting room clinic that services the residents mainly of Riverton Park. Um, I've built that clinic up from eight hours a week to 32 hours a week of care. Um, I now have another provider there with me who used to be my community health outreach worker who graduated as a PA here last year, Malwell. Um, and uh, Riverton is kids and families and women's health and um, immigrant health and refugee health. Um, and the other part of my time, I really have developed um, our family planning services for Greater Portland Health. So I spend a day a week at our main location, Park Ave, really working with contraceptive care, um, starting a colposcopy clinic for our patients, um, women's health care, prenatal care, all of that. Um, on my way here, I was thinking a little bit about a little example of giving you just some thoughts of really trying to be in someone else's shoes when you're really giving care um, to uh, patients walking in with some significant disparities. Um, my 10.30 showed up at 11. My 11 showed up at 11.15. Both had needing um, interpretation. I had a car and I still got here late right? Couldn't find a parking spot. I read English. I know how to find parking spots. Couldn't find one. Navigating that, I grew up in America, I speak this language, was hard enough. Um, imagine that any sign is not in your language. Clocks were not what you grew up with. Um, understanding that you arrive on time to a visit. You've never gone to a doctor before unless you were in acute emergency. These are challenges that are so monumentally um, important to understand when you start giving care to people walking in with very different stories than your own. Um, meeting someone where they are, trying to respect um, that their experience is very much leading their pathway through healthcare. Um, is, is so respectful of um, just being able to give a really um, 
culturally sensitive care. Um, and it is very challenging, but it is the most rewarding work I've ever done in my 12 years. And the fact that we can do it here in Maine is amazing. Um, you know, just a little example, you know, Portland, Greater Portland Health, we give 46% free care. Um, we have a almost 16 to 20% no-show rate. Uh, most federally qualified health centers are averaging around 5% no-show rate and average, on average, about 15 to 18% free care. We have huge challenges with the population in greater Portland area. Um, and meeting those challenges takes a lot of ingenuity, a lot of patience, and a lot of collaboration. Working together with our partners is how we're going to really close gaps in these services um, for this um, growing and rich and just beautiful population that we have now in Portland. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do. Happy to answer questions. I don't know what the format is. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, one thing is I just want to let you guys know that some of our students will need to leave early um, just because of their class schedule. The other thing is, is um, I don't know how many here can, by a show of hands, were, was how many of you were able to attend the IPAC event we did in the fall? Not too many people. So I'm just going to give you a very, very quick context because these really are the experts that can talk to you much, much more about um, providing health care to the refugee and immigrant uh, communities. Um, I used to run the Refugee Services Program for the City of Portland. I did that for 12 years. And so I just want to let you know that Catholic Charities Maine Refugee and Immigration Services is the only resettlement agency in the state. Um, folks get here two ways. One, through Catholic Charities, which the way folks get here through Catholic Charities is they're in a refugee camp and some are there for 10, 15, 20 years. It's a very, very lengthy process um, to try to get approved to come into the United States or another surrounding country um, in order for you to have refugee status. There's a lengthy, lengthy process. So folks that are come in as a refugee are resettled by Catholic Charities, which means if, they, if a family arrives at 2 a.m. in the morning, Catholic Charities is there to pick them up. And they get funding in order to do that. So that's the first way folks come into the country. The second way folks... They also have main care for six months. It's a huge difference versus the other way that someone comes into the country. And interpreters, and a driver, yeah. and a case manager. It's like a golden ticket yes. for six months. Yeah. And so um, obviously we'll, we'll get, I think those are wonderful points, and we will definitely get back to talking about some of the barriers that folks face when they come to the country as a refugee camp, from a refugee camp. The other way that folks come into the country is when they come in seeking asylum. And when they come into the country seeking asylum, they pretty much apply for a visa, and a visa is not a visa card. <laughs> ah, anyway. Um, <clears throat> there are many, many, many types of visas. There's a religious visa, a sports visa, um, a visitor's visa. There's all kinds of visas that somebody can apply for to come into the country. And basically, somebody is applying to come into the country because um, of their fear of persecution. And so they apply to the United States, um, and they say, you know what, we're going to come and visit for a year with no intention of leaving, because obviously they can't, because they would be killed um, if they were to go back to their home country. When somebody comes in uh, seeking asylum, that's also a lengthy process. You have to apply for asylum with United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. And eventually, you'll go in front of an immigration officer, and you have to have your story down packed. If you don't, you will get deported. Um, somebody coming in seeking asylum um, has no access to any federal services or federal funding. So they have to rely on, um, in the state of Maine, they have to rely on what we call general assistance, which is a state-run program. And it's not 
it's not a great system. We're glad it's there, but um, it's not a great system. So those really are the two ways that folks come into the country. I just wanted to let you know that. So while we're talking about um, you know services, um, that you can also be thinking. And I love what you said about um, you know trying to get here and you know knowing you have a car and you know how to get here. Um, and most of our asylum seekers or refugees, um, unfortunately, don't have that. Um, don't have that. Um, option. Yeah, and the process is um, really re-traumatization of an experience of multiple experiences that have already patients and res our population have already walked through uh, unbelievable traumas in their home country. Um, I have patients who've been waiting five years for their interview. That is being flipped by the current administration where we are now seeing patients come in seeking asylum are the first ones to get their interview. And they're not prepared. They haven't worked with ILAP. They haven't met with healthcare. I um, is. Im yeah, the immigrant, they're the, people, the legal people that help. <laughs> I can't keep all the acronyms down. Immigrant legal advisory. Legal immigrant, oh my god, now I'm messing up. See? Advocacy, advocacy project there you go. and they're um, yep. one of the only organizations in the state of Maine that helps you apply for asylum yes but what's happening is is they're going to be flipped for people who are <laughs> waiting for five years for their interview process are now going to wait even longer and people who have just come in within the last three months are going to have to be ready for this process very quickly um, it's a very different scenario and it is um, really traumatic um, for patients also, um, if women have been raped, they, they are very ashamed about this and don't often say anything about it when they get here. Whereas if they did, the lawyers could help them get asylum a whole lot easier. So Ann Hallward has developed a group who helps them practice saying what they need to say to advocate for themselves so they can get the attention that they need. But it takes a process for them to be able to speak it because they're so shame-based. We see a lot of patients that are, um, have been, I guess, disowned from their families and their society because drinking is such a taboo subject um, in a lot of their cultures. And so we end up seeing a lot of people that have no support systems, do not speak the language, they have no, they can't get employment and, and they have so much trauma that a lot of them will end up on the streets. Um, it's kind of a, they're kind of like ghosts. We tried to start a, a group, a Somali group, um, try to get these men into, back into services, trying to get them some medical help as well as some um, behavioral health programs. And it was, it's so hard to even try to get them into a group because they're so afraid of being found out about their um, drinking issues or any other issues. And they're so ashamed that they, they're not housed or they're not employed um, or that they lost their family. And that's a group that we really struggle with. And there's, there's actually a good number of people like this here we, that are hidden um, that we just don't see. So, so for me, I'm gonna come from the aura health aspect of things. And as a dentist, you know, aura health is even even amongst Americans, you know, those that live in the United States, aura health is like the, the last thing on your mind, really. <laughs> you know, you, you're probably going to think of something else before you think of, oh, what have, what's happening in my mouth. So just imagine as an immigrant or, you know, any, an individual that falls within this group, you know, whatever is going on in their mouth or any toothache is the last thing on their mind, you know. You have to think of, I have to eat, I have to provide for my kids, you know, you, basically you have to like, you know, put your preference, your, you know, your order of preference of what, what should come first. And oral, oral health care is like the last thing on anybody's mind. And the truth is that, imagine a child who, who lives in a, in a home where, you know, to eat, they basically just feed on carbohydrate diets. And there's no much information on oral hygiene instructions toothbrushing and you know what they need to do and preventive care. This child, because of the too much of carbohydrate diet, ends up having a tooth decay and 
that's the last thing on any, any you know the, the mother's the mother's mind to think of where am I going to get money to provide you know for a rest to, to have a filling or to have a tooth removed or to have a tooth restored that's the last thing they will ever be thinking of and they tend to live with this pain and sometimes this toothache could cause so much pain that a child goes tend to have sleepless nights and how would a, such a child be able to concentrate in class the following day and it, it's, it's just like a, you know, it, just, it just continues on and on. And the toothache itself can eventually lead to something, you know, something way bad than just a toothache. There could be an infection spreading down to the jaw, to the neck. And even sometimes toothache itself, if left for a very long time, can actually cause destruction of a bone, of the jaw bone. And that destruction of a jaw bone, which we call a cyst, can eventually result into cancer. In some cases, in few cases, uh, you know, so that's why, and like I said earlier on, in most people, when you think about when you think about health, your health is kind of placed down there. Now, just imagine an immigrant who has to deal with so many other things, having to deal with, you know, our health. So I think we need, as healthcare professionals, being able to have that sense that, you know, it's not just it's not just you know what they are dealing with right now but thinking of what they have what they've gone through to be here and what they are still going through and it's very important that you know for our groups I, I don't know if you guys have oral health care as part of what you guys do uh, you know because we know dental care is expensive and most insurances don't even cover cover dental care you probably have to pay out of pocket so so yeah so I think oral health also should be a very big component in this and we should try to see how we could help them He, just from the pediatric dental side, I know that um, when I started, I would say, oh, you don't have a dentist. Here's a list of dentists, and uh, I now do it very differently, but I actually, we have a dental clinic um, with a hygienist in all of the, not all, but many of the, West, uh, the main medical partners' offices, so you can literally walk them up the stairs and put them in the chair, and then the school-based clinics through yeah. Greater Portland Health that you can speak more eloquently about have them, but also putting in those dental referrals and calling because I, I will see families and we'll talk about three or four things and one of them is diffuse decay, so much so that the child's not eating because it hurts so much and talking about concentration in school, you know, while the teeth may not be their acute issue, if they're not able to concentrate and get farther and farther behind in school, it's just one of the many layers that um, complicates life. So I think, you know, you're, you're spot on and I think it's getting access to dental health care is improving, but a lot of times these kids need to be taken to an OR and put under sedation to have multiple teeth extracted um, because it's so diffuse. Or just think about someone who's never had a dentist look at their mouth before and their first language is not English, or I have several children who are um, autistic um, as well as non-English speakers. Um, think of that experience, that fear, that trauma of having someone work in their mouth. Um, we do at Greater Portland Health have embedded dental clinics, um, again, just with the population we're working with and the population that's spreading into other areas, Westbrook and Biddeford. Having integrated services is pretty much the only way that you can really meet their needs. So. We have social workers and case managers and outreach workers and dental um, and behavioral health services. And uh, we have multiple sites uh, which allows for access. Um, why Riverton Park works is I can knock on someone's door if they don't come. And I know where they are and I know if the kid has gotten on a bus to school or not. Um, it is how things work um, for populations where they're really on the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They're thinking about the next meal. They're thinking about what came in the mail and if it's a bill or if it's not a bill, and what that means. Um, they're thinking about does the kid have shoes on or not today. Um, and it's really complex and really overwhelming. I think the school is another resource and the physician for the Westbrook Public Schools and being able to go to the school a couple times a month, um, we can provide vaccines in the school so that the kids, a lot of the refugees 
or asylee seeking um, or um, families, kids that are being transient through foster homes or relocating through homelessness, they are behind on vaccine schedules and it's a complicated spacing and requires lots of trips back to the doctor's office to get vaccines and so we're trying to bring the vaccines to them in the school so mom and dad can consent but they don't have to be present for all those every four weeks shots. Likewise, the dental fairies, having dental services in the school, uh, Portland High School is way better than <laughs> Westbrook is at this point, but you know, it's, it's good to have a, a role model out there. So the schools is another resource. And just to talk briefly about, I work for the Westbrook School Department, um, and just to talk briefly about that because um, it all is intersectional. Um, we have a health form that parents need to fill out and it is not written into different languages. Okay, don't tell anybody in Westbrook, I told you. Um, I'm just saying, it's, and we know that there is an issue with not only our forms that need to be translated, um, but forms you know, in other schools that are not translated. And so uh, we had a situation where you know, a child who did not speak English brought the form home, the parent signed it, um, and come to find out he had um, a, a, a major heart um, issue. I'm not quite sure what it was called, um, but he was not supposed to be doing sports. Um, and it was somebody in the school that recognized that he was getting on the bus to go to this sport activity um, and said, uh, I don't think so, and told the principal, and it could have ended up in a very, very different situation. Um, we caught it in time. Um, and so we have talked a lot about the barriers. Oh, I know you wanted to say another something else, Erico. No, um, for especially the substance use, the integrated care is really important because this has so much impact on their medical um, health as well as dental. A lot of them will probably by the time they're 30 for chronic um, substance use um, users um, will probably not have any teeth. And main care has very, very limited um, coverage for dental care. So a lot of them, even if they have uh, main care, will wait until the very, very last minute where they think they're, they're on their deathbed and they'll go to ER to get it extracted because that is what main care pays for. So a lot of them, uh, we've seen, we've been able to refer people to our dentists um, on our program just for some preventive care, just teeth cleaning, and they probably have never had it before in their whole entire life. And the integrated care, just have, being able to say, hey, let's go and make an appointment for you right now is so important because if we give them a, a phone number, they'll never do it. It never gets done and they never get the care. Um, so I don't know um, if, if you guys, I mean, I have some questions, um, but I didn't know if anybody had any other questions. I can certainly come and give you the mic. Um, we've heard a lot about some of the barriers. It really is rewarding work. Um, um, working with the refugee and immigrant community, the, you know, the smile on their face when you um, was able to connect them with a dentist um, or you were able to tell them what happened to their body um, is really, really rewarding. Um, and so um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Um, if not, I can, anybody? Oh, there's one. Yes, I've had patients bring me food, literally from, from the food pantry. I've had some, a patient bring me extra squashes and extra things that she got at the food pantry. Um, the trust, if you build it, um, it is immeasurable. Um, and the impact, this very, it, it's just simple things that you can do for someone are the most meaningful things to them. Hi, um, I just had a question uh, about the um, sexual assault with refugees and education. What are some of the things that you do to destigmatize sexual assault? Did you say desacratize? Destigmatize sexual assault. We um, we do not address the fact that they that we understand that they could have been assaulted. What we do is we uh, meet them where they are in terms of their questions, um, and then take it from there to educate them. Um, in her presence is a wonderful advocacy program, so they make sure that they get the behavioral health. Um, work that they need. And we are not, as teachers, 
in a, in a role of providing care. I myself, as a women's health nurse practitioner, when a uh, traumatized woman would come for an exam, I would very carefully um, meet her where she was. Strategies like um, being afraid to get into the stirrups. So I'd have, she, I had one patient lying on the floor of my office, on the rug. Um, many patients will insert their own specula so that they're in charge. We, we make it very clear that they're in charge of their body and that they um, get to say no. And even providers, they get to say no to providers if they don't want to be touched. We had a great example last week. Um, a, a woman said, my husband, through the interpreter, my husband I think is sleeping around and I'm nursing my baby. If he comes and sucks on my breast, could my baby get a sexually transmitted infection? And the nurse midwife who answered her question said, first of all, it's very important that you understand that you get to decide who touches your breast. If you decide that you want your husband to uh, suck on your breast when you're nursing, be assured that there is one orally transmitted, um, sexually transmitted infection, oral chlamydia, but it would be good to see a provider to make sure that you're clear and he's clear so that you know where you're starting and then to set some ground rules with your husband, set some boundaries about that. So we want the woman to feel empowered to take charge. That's a really good question, thank you. I grew up in the culture and you know what you said, you know, the woman has the right to her body and she can tell her husband, don't touch me. I grew up in a culture that that is very, 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 very difficult. <laughs> That's the truth. You know, you get, you know, you should get married. It's it's very difficult. So, yeah. I know. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm an occupational therapy student here, and I'm to thank you all for coming and uh, chatting with us today. Um, so I've heard you talk about substance use and building social supports and the necessity of life skills, um, building those with immigrant population, um, and just engaging in daily occupation and how that can contribute to successful living um, for this population. But I uh, haven't heard occupational therapy mentioned as part of like the inter interdisciplinary team. And I'm wondering if you guys um, engage with, with occupational therapists or how we sort of play the role in um, the greater Portland health scene. I would say a lot also relies on coverage and insurance and resources. Um, we have, um, we integrate students into Greater Portland Health. We have nursing students, PA students, medical students. Um, we have an ocu uh, we have a osteopathic doctor who works there. Um, we have tried to get PT before, some, some in, and it, it's been a space issue, but um, Integrating the services is always, unfortunately, a little bit due to who's going to pay for them. Are they, does someone have insurance or are they on our sliding scale? And if they're on our sliding scale, how can we um, convince other organizations to take on our patients for these services? Um, finance has a lot to do with access to care um, in general. But we try to, we have volunteer, we have a um, neurologist who has retired who sees patients once a week for our clinic. We have um, an orthopedic surgeon who has retired and sees patients at our clinic once a week. Um, so we are more than willing to take on anyone who wants to volunteer time and work with our patients. It would be fantastic. Um, I think it's a much needed service and PT and OT would be great to continue to integrate into our patients' lives. Um, and if it can happen in their medical home, then it's more fluid. I refer patients out who have been in this country for years now and getting to a physical therapist is one of the most challenging experiences. Um, for some reason, and main care pays for six visits a year anyways. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's challenging. Yeah. In the pediatric scene, we have the luxury of being in schools, 
and so um, if they're in school, they can qualify through CDS, Child Development Services, or once they're in school, an IEP plan, and that can include occupational therapy that can be provided in the school setting, or CDS will do it in the home if they're under three. So that can be um, once they get main care, or if they're uninsured but in public school, those are how we can access it for kids. So yes, we need help. <laughs> yes. I have a question back here. Yeah. Um, I believe this is mostly a question for Eriko, but I was wondering if you could speak to the differences that refugees and immigrants have received care compared to the uh, countries that you've lived in where they have a more nationalized health care system. So my experience, um, behavioral health, social services in Asia is very rare. It's just starting to come around, but it is very, very rare. Um, to go see a uh, social worker or a psychiatrist or a psychologist is almost, um, it's changing quite a bit now, but it is uh, almost taboo. If you have any mental health issues, you don't want to talk about it, you don't want people to know about it. It is a, it, it is a very difficult um, um, subject. So trying to tell my parents and my relatives what I do is it, 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 it's it, it's a conversation and a half and they just don't get that concept like if they have a problem why do they have to come see you like if they drink it's okay so long as it's social right but so it's very different and I think um, the type of services that are covered is also different um, when you have the national health care services it does cover for a lot of the basic things and it also, um, but it doesn't, because the, the culture, it doesn't cover for the social services piece as well. Um, thank God for, I, probably I shouldn't say this, but um, if it wasn't for Fukushima and the earthquake, social services would probably still, at, to this day, almost no. Right now they're starting to provide a lot of services like this now um, to help with the families, help with the students um, across the board. And we've been bringing in a lot of um, Australian and American um, social workers to help understand how that, um, how behavioral health works because we just didn't have enough people in Japan to just even treat a room full of patients. Very different, but the national care, health care pays for it. All right. Um. Um, hi. Uh, someone else would love to speak. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so one of the questions that I had was. Uh, it's interesting even watching the dynamic of you all up here, and thank you all for coming. But it's interesting how you have your perspective of teaching and talking about, you know, what types of requests women can make, women can make about their bodies. And then you had kind of said, and then this is also the cultural reality. Um, so one of the things I'm wondering is on your like various teams that you work with, how many new mainers are there? How many like cultural brokers are there? Are you not only having conversations with like one-on-one -on -one clients of what do you need as an individual, or is there also kind of like a body of knowledge that's being built up and like kind of concentrated around, these are typical things that come up, and how can we have these conversations, or what resources do we need to start providing that we don't like necessarily recognize with mostly like Caucasian, westernized like Mainers who were born here, things like that. So uh, being a federally qualified health center, we are board run and more than 50% have to be patients. So that's first. Our clinic is made up, it's um, overseeing site is also patient based. We have a patient advisory council where we invite patients to be a part of problem solving. Um, we, if you ever have a chance to come in to Greater Portland Health at any site, um, you will see all the languages being spoken at the front desk. Um, all our patients turn into volunteers, our volunteers turn into front office staff, our front office staff turns into practice managers. 
Um, we have medical assistants um, from different countries who are speaking different languages. We have providers um, who speak different languages, um, French, Spanish, Arabic. We have a social worker who speaks Arabic and Somali. Um, one of our, our director of behavioral health services has worked in trauma care with refugees for her whole career as a social worker. Um, so it is vitally important um, that you bring that knowledge from the patients you're serving as well. You have to integrate it to understand, um, to, to cross over um, gaps. Yes, I believe so. We were recruited by In Her Presence, which is run by a Burundi woman um, who did marketing, I think, in, in uh, Burundi and has been in the United States for over five years, Claudette. And, and, and her name's really long, and I'm sorry I can't let it slip off my tongue. And a board member of In Her Presence, Mickey Bondo, who's um, from the Congo. And they're the ones who requested that we integrate our, our services into their um, English-speaking volunteer services. And they're developing a whole health program. So we uh, deferred to them to say, what, what do we, we don't want to be the white women telling them what they need to learn. We need to hear from you what they, what's important for them to learn. And then we learn with each time we do it from the women. So being culturally sensitive, I think, is a learning curve. Um, and implicit bias is very important to recognize and to try to get through. So it's a very, very good question. And it's very true that knowledge is, knowledge is power. And the truth is that, you know, with time, when these women get to have this knowledge and, you know, they get to understand some of these things, then, you know, within their own smaller communities, they can then propagate this information to their friends and, you know, and, and, and so forth. But something that I also talked about that can also be interesting is, you know, we're trying to, you know, tell these women, no, this is this is the norm. This is what could happen. It would actually be nice also if we bring the men along, because the truth is that these women are going to, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to go back homes, and the way now back to culture in Africa. Africa is a continent. You know, we have so many countries. I'm from Nigeria. The way we see it is that the man is the head of the home. Whatever the man says stands. <laughs> That's really. Back home, that's the way the culture is. So it would be nice to try to integrate the men into this into these resources and let them know, let them learn these norms, let them because by the time they, st they themselves start getting this exposure, their views and their mindsets will start to change. They will have to, they'll start having better understanding of okay, oh, this is the way I'm supposed to treat a woman. You know, this is the way you know I'm supposed to understand that she's in charge of her body. You know, she can make decisions. She can decide what she wants. To eat this morning, you know, and this, uh, so it will also be nice to integrate men into this discussion and give them these resources, teach them, let them know, and with that, everything will start changing in that light. Um, and something else to think about is that unless someone comes as a refugee unit, most people come in fractured families. So you have a mom coming with two of the five children or three of the four children, or you have the man coming by himself where his family is still um, in his country. Um, that just poses other challenges, um, other things come up, new relationships happen here, Re new relationship happens in home countries. Um, and I think it is really wonderful because I do work in both settings. I work with a lot of families that are units. I work with a lot of men who've come here by themselves, um, either young or older. Um, and then I work with a lot of women who are here navigating this transition and these now sole financial responsibility for a family. Um, it's, it is a, it's a lot. It's a lot. So uh, being a pharmacy student, I feel left out. So I was wondering, like, what role, <laughs> what, 
What role do you believe pharmacy has to play in the yeah. organization? Yeah. Um, Thank you. you know, in the hospital setting, I, you have the luxury of pharmacies always there, and they teach you a lot. And so I think the greatest learning point I ever took from a pharmacy student, and if you can take this forward, go forth. But um, we would draw pictures, and I do this to this day. Uh, I have a sun coming up, and then I have the sun going down, and I draw pictures and color them with colored pencils at my desk of the pictures of the pills that you need to take throughout the day. And so, I mean, I can't pronounce most of the medications we use, and never mind in a different language, and certain times of day, and dosing, and Q8, and QHS, and PRN, it's like hogwash. So. Having the pharmacist be able to translate it both first, you know, from science words to English words to something tangible that they can take home and go into the home and deliver that medicine or um, it, it, I think, you know, it's hugely powerful. So um, the pictograph is my favorite, but. Um, in healthcare where I, education is, I chose the NP road, road because I get to spend more time with my patients. So I have them come back with all the bottles, all the bottles, bring all the bottles, all the bottles, just bring them. We sit, I help them get rid of some bottles. I luckily have people with me that speak Somali, write Somali, speak Arabic, write Arabic. We write on bottles, we write on paper, we, you know. Um, but if I have a sick kid at Riverton, they're coming to see me. I'm, I'm trying to find out if they've taken their medication day in and day out. Um, also just working with that, the fact that understanding patients don't understand the importance of medication sometimes and that how, when they're supposed to pick it up. They've left their doctor's office with a kid who's draining an ear infection. They don't get the medication for 48 hours because that's not the highest need for them. Um, so a lot happens in between them leaving my office and them getting to you for that medication. And a lot of things get miscommunicated and a lot of things get um, unsaid sometimes. But pharmacists, if they can be more involved in clinic settings, um, it, would, it would be amazing. Yes, yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> Call us. Yep. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so much happens and cultural things happen. I mean, I had a woman's A1C go from seven to thirteen, and I brought it back down to eight because I went to her home and I set up her medications. Um, and cultural things happen. Belief of diseases, belief of chronic illnesses um, is, a, is a challenge. Um, but pharmacists can play a big role in the outcomes for sure. Thank you for bringing that up. Anybody else have a question? Um, so a few of you have already talked about the value of having an integrated care team in addressing the behavioral and medical and social needs of your patients. Um, I am just curious um, if kind of with your immigrant and refugee patients who may have extensive histories of trauma are in a new country, afraid, not able to speak the language. Um, have you found that it's been more challenging to have them accept more providers into their care team? Um, and if so, how have you addressed that successfully? I do think it is a large part of where someone is coming from, what country, um, sometimes. Um, our newest asylees, you know, how we do care at Greater Port and Health, um, the, you know, a lot of people speak their language, I think they welcome it. They welcome more help. They welcome people sitting with them and talking. Welcoming opening up into a traditional counseling role, that takes, that can be, um, have some boundaries and some hurdles, but 
um, being heard for the first time possibly ever about what their concerns are uh, is very welcomed. We tend to be in the integrated health care system. Um, we see patients that have been Greater Portland Health patients for a uh, few months or year or even several years before we realize that they could use um, counseling services. Um, a lot of times the referrals will come through the primary care physician or, you know, like with Kate and say, hey, I think this she could use some help with some counseling. She's got some trauma that I'm just coming to realize because they're starting to open up to the physician because the trust has been, um, the relations has been um, established. So they're finally starting to reveal some of the, um, their life um, history, I guess, their trauma, and then uh, we get the referrals. So the patient has already been established. They have some trust. Um, going on with some of their uh, health care providers. Uh, they know the nurses, they know the MAs, they know the physicians. So we're a little bit, uh, it's not easy, but we already know the patient somewhat um, um, on the, I guess, in the very beginning stages. And that's where usually the counseling services start, is that because we have this integrated that they can come in and they've, they've been there for a few, few months or a year. We offer it um, in our initial new refugee or new asylee intake, and I try to preface it as like um, there's a lot to just um, adjusting into the state of Maine, and try and offer it just as just adjustment. Like it doesn't matter if you've suffered trauma, even though all, being just relocated to Maine can be traumatic. So I think is it, and, and and a lot sometimes the families are open to that. Other times, if a family has been referred and some, for someone who has really severe PTSD, uh, they're now mute and incontinent, and, um, and they can see that child really turn around and start to thrive, then you'll start to see their siblings say, oh, okay, I think I'm ready, I'd be interested, and then friends of that family, because they trust their own before they would rightfully so trust um, someone else, so um, slow and steady. Anyone else? I'm wondering if you can give um, our students um, just some really good advice, maybe one word or some, some advice in working with the refugee and immigrant population. Compassion. Say love. I mean, we are so lucky to have them here. And um, they make, every day I have one in my clinic, it is hands down my best patient interaction. So. I try to say every time I see them, I am so glad that you made it here today. Um, you are so beautiful. Some, something as simple as just let them know we are so grateful. And I think just remembering that their, each person's standard is different from yours, from our standard. Um, I come from a different background, different culture. Um, I was lucky to have the education and um, have that financial background. Um, I didn't have to come here because I, I was forced to come here. Um, I came here of my choice, um, but I still had a hard time um, navigating myself around um, anything, just anything, getting a driver's license. Um, I spoke English, I went to college, and figuring out where I had to go, how much I had to pay, um, those were all new things for me, and I, if you know, if I think about it, if I struggled with that, people that do not speak the language or people that have no backgrounds um, and they have no financial means, it's got to be a hundred times harder than what I went through. So having that understanding and compassion. I find that I learn more than I teach. And just being open and being an active listener and being present, um, hearing their stories because their stories en en enrich our stories and help us remember that we are all connected. Uh, like, like you said, I, I also understand there's a big thing about understanding that we're different in our different ways. Uh, just because someone doesn't speak English 
doesn't necessarily mean the person is dumb. Because the truth is that there are some countries that their official language is French. They probably, they probably went to, to college back there before oh, the war broke out or something. So in their own country, they are educated. You know, and, because, and, and the truth is that if we're not very careful, we have this prejudice. Oh, it doesn't speak like I speak. Or this person speaking with an accent. And just within the back of your mind, you just have this, this cloud about this individual. But if you're able to break through that barrier, to able to understand that people are different, and the truth is that there's so much, there's so much to benefit from having different people together. There's so much you can learn from them. That's the truth. There's so much, you know. I can learn. I, I, I've, I've learned a lot since when I came into this country, and the truth also is that for those who are close to me, there's a lot they can also learn from me. So I'm just having that openness, that awareness that being different is not something bad. Is that actually very good? Um, I'm sure you can tell how much I love what I do. Um, love, respect, uh, humility, leave your ego at the door. You do not know more than that person across from you. Um, they might know a lot more than you do. Um, I've learned so much. Um, I'm very fortunate that my children are also in the Portland Public Schools and their experience is so rich um, from being in classrooms where kids are speaking other languages around them. Um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful community to be a part of, but love and respect. Um, and I would just add, um, you know, we have families that obviously transition um, into the United States, um, and um, we want them to assimilate into the United States. But just remember that they have their own culture, um, and just respect the fact that they have their own culture, and try not to, not necessarily change it, but be respectful of the fact um, that <clears throat> we have Ramadan, and um, yes, do not schedule appointments before 11 a.m. during that time. It just, your patients won't come and think of that. Like, this is just, be respectful. Um, this is, and they will not take medications during this time period. Um, understand that, you know, try to put your ego down and respect that that for someone is more important than managing their diabetes for those 30 days. Well, and another example is, is they have traditional healing. And so, again, you have to be respectful of that. I experienced that, and I, it blew my mind, because I was just like, you know, you got to do it this way. Um, and thank God I was, you know, thank God I was working with people, um, you know, from another country who said, no, this is actually, this is how we heal. Um, it obviously wasn't a way that I would have suggested it, but I had to be respectful of that person and where they were from, and that that person truly believed um, that their traditional healing method was going to heal the person who had some serious mental health issues. So I don't know if anybody has any last words. I don't know if there's any other last questions out there that anybody has. I think we go until, supposed to go until 1.30, but there isn't any reason why we can't get out early. Um, so I really, really want to thank our panel. Um, I can't tell you how much um, that I appreciate you coming um, and sharing your stories and your work um, and your passion um, and your love for this work. And so thank you very much for coming. Um, Um, I also want to give a shout out um, to Alyssa and Jane Hubley. Uh, we have some students here from Lyman Moore Middle School, right? Right? Yeah. If you guys can stand up, these are some middle school students who may at one point in time be UNA student, UNE students. So, so thank you so much for coming. And thank everybody else for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks.